All right. I think we have most people here. Um, I'll do some housekeeping and wait a little bit more, but just want to say thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I just wanted to note as well that in this session we have staff from the Commission, um, from eight electricity transmission licensees, as the code would apply to them, um, as well as staff from AMO, the Australian Energy Infrastructure Commissioner and VicGrid, just given their involvement in Victorian transmission. And <clears throat> in terms of this session, we'll have a presentation that will step through the code. Um, we'll have a time at the very end for questions. So if I could just ask if you do have a question throughout the session, please write it down. And at the very end, we'll ask for Q and A's and we can um, do a whole part section dedicated to that. Uh, another thing I just say is today we'll be recording the session as well. So just um, be, take note of that um, before we begin. I'd like to officially start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Uh, for me, I'm in Melbourne, and for me, that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and pay respects to those who may be with us today as well. Uh, when we talk about land access, it's important to remember that these lands and sovereignty were never ceded. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron Yun. I'm a director at the uh, Central Services Commission. I oversee our analysis and reform functions in the energy uh, division. And so what my uh, what my team uh, looks over is the changing of energy rules in Victoria um, that we administer, um, but also analysis of the broader markets that we regulate as well in energy. Uh, I'm joined by many from our energy reform team at the Commission um, who will be taking you through some of the slides today. So I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to come and we hope this will be um, of use to you. Uh, so the purpose of this session is really to talk you through the new land access code of practice, which we completed late last year. And our hope is that the code itself should be quite clear in terms of setting out rules for land access. So um, I just ask that uh, you go back to the, that code, go back to those obligations and be familiar with that. That's the primary um, rule book um, to look at. At the same time, I realise that it's useful to talk through things and talk through the rules and obligations to better help you uh, set up your processes and gear up for uh, this the application of the code and for complying with it as it applies from March this year. Uh, next slide. So as a quick recap and background, so this code is all about land access and its focus is on the statutory rights that transmission licensees have to access private land in Victoria. Those rights are in section 93 of the Electricity Industry Act. And I think it's right to say that with such rights come um, responsibilities. And the Land Access Code of Practice sets out those responsibilities as obligations and requirements that transmission companies have to follow before using Section 93 rights. And I also just want to note that the code is an enforceable one. So that means the Commission can take compliance and enforcement action where there's any potential breaches of the code and that comes with the responsibility of, um, of these rights as transmission licensees. So what are we trying to achieve with the land access code of practice? We recognise that new transmissions needed in Victoria to support the energy transition, but we also recognise that a lot of these developments, they have to be done in partnership with community, in particular landowners. And so a key aim of the code of practice is for a transmission company to effectively engage with people prior to accessing any private land, particularly for new transmission projects. And I think we're conscious that for many people, their first interaction with a transmission company might be a discussion on the need to access their private land. For some people, this might be a simple conversation, but for others, and I think we would all be aware of this, it might be a very difficult one. And in many respects, first impressions mean a lot. And that's where the code of practice uh, really sets in. And, uh, and in terms of its objectives, the code 
really aims to balance the statutory right of electricity transmission licensees to access private land with the rights of people who are affected by it. You'll see throughout this presentation that there's a series of obligations that transmission companies are to follow under the code before, during and after the use of statutory powers to access land and before entering into an access agreement. And if you step back um, behind it all, the code really aims for effective engagement. And effective engagement relies on clarity and transparency for those who are impacted about things like processes or potential impacts on their land when it comes to um, accessing that land. And it's also helped there to design to help uh, landowners make more informed decisions about whether to enter into access agreements in a voluntary basis as well. The other key part of effective engagement is that it relies on genuine consideration of an affected party's concerns and needs. And so the code has that in mind uh, when transmission companies uh, engage with people who are affected. This is all part of the responsibility that comes with the rights of transmission companies to access land. So I just really want to reiterate that objective and the place where the land access code is coming from and what we're looking for from transmission licensees um, going forward. So next slide. A really quick history and background to this code. Many of you are probably aware of, of all this, but um, over the last few years, we've been engaging very much with industry and stakeholders and community and government to think through uh, the obligations or the requirements that's for transmission companies when it comes to accessing land. And it's began back in December 2021 um, when we were drawn to concerns about uh, about the access of land using statutory powers, and it culminated into an interim statement of expectations on land access. Uh, that uh, statement of expectations was not enforceable, but it did include principles uh, of engagement and principles of what good land access would look like. And really the land access code of practice builds on that, following lots of engagement over the last year and a half um, to come to where we are today. And so um, this is where we are at. And, um, and the main difference between the statement of expectations and the code of practice is that the code of practice is enforceable, which I mentioned previously. Next slide. So today we're going to go and step through what the code is. Hopefully many of you have already read the code and read our final decision to the code. If not, I strongly encourage you to, to do that and keep referring to the code when you do see it. Um, but hopefully this will give a bit of colour to um, to what the code is about. This is a bit of a flow chart of um, what you would see in the code in a, in a visual format. I won't go through it to, right now because the team will step you through um, all the different parts of the code and how it um, plays out in practice. But I just want to say before I pass it on to Jean-Paul, um, thank you again for coming. We hope that this is useful to you and that um, this helps you uh, comply with the code as it moves forward as well. So Jean-Paul. Thanks, Aaron. Um, hi, everyone. For those of you who haven't met, I'm Jean-Paul and one of the two managers of the energy reform team at the commission. And I was managing the development of the land, code of practice, land access code of practice last year. Um, thanks for coming today. We're here to clarify and answer your questions. And I would like to start with next slide, please, uh, to present the structure of the code of practice and how this process that we presented in the flowchart is structured in this new instrument that we just released. Um, it's a relatively simple code. It has four parts. First, the first part it relates to preliminary information that includes the purpose of the code, the date of effect, a glossary, um, the application of the code of practice that I'm going to explain in the, on the next slides. Uh, it also has part two with obligations before accessing land using section 93 powers or before entering into an access agreement. And this obligations relates to better practice for communication, engagement, revision of information and notices that are sent out to affected parties. Then the third part of the code relates to access when section 93 powers are used, um, general obligations to minimize impact on land and also specific obligation to manage specific risks. 
And then the final part of the code relates to post taxes and ongoing obligations related to this particular solution, record keeping obligations and reporting obligations in relation to access via section 83, but also access when an access agreement is entered into. Next slide, please. First of all, I think the most important thing to clarify is who are the regulated parties and what type of activities the code covers. Um, through based on significant feedback we received through our consultation process last year, um, we said that the code of practice will apply to all transmission companies, that is all the electricity transmission licenses that hold a license issued by us, by the commission, in relation to works undertaken on private land. The code of practice um, defines what it's we, what we understand for works, what we understand for private land, and in relation to the type of activities or projects, it's on one hand in relation to new transmission projects. Those are projects in on lands where there's no electricity transmission assets at the moment, but also in relation to existing assets, it will regulate augmentation, replacement, and the commissioning of existing assets beyond existing easements or access agreements. The reasoning for that is that we think that where it's a, there is a similar impact or a potential impact on landowners, similar rules should apply. And we think that th those type of activities, those upgrades beyond existing easements or existing agreements uh, should follow the same rules than new transmission projects. Next slide, please. Equally important is to clarify what the code, the code does not cover and what it, does, it, it does, not, does not apply to. First of all, in relation to existing assets, it does not operate for uh, cover operational maintenance, maintenance of existing transmission assets. However, uh, we made it very clear in our final decision that we do expect that companies to follow the processes set in the code of practice where possible. Um, we believe that those rules could facilitate engagement and could help to get into a collaborative relationship with landowners and other affected parties. And also we mentioned in our final decision paper that while right now the current version of the code of practice do does not apply to operation and maintenance activities, that is something that we will review in the future. And if we see a need to expand the scope of the code of practice, we would start a new re review of the code through our regular consultation processes. Um, so that's something also to take in mind, consider take into consideration. Um, the code of practice also doesn't regulate access via an access agreement or an easement. Uh, that means that actual access under an easement or under an access agreement would occur under those terms, the terms of negotiated agreements. However, um, there's some information that needs to be provided before entering into an access agreement and also their ongoing reporting obligation in relation to access agreements that uh, transmission companies will have to comply with. A third uh, important topic is compensation. The compensation is not regulated under the code of practice. That's regulated in a different act in the Land Acquisition and Compensation Act. Um, however, the code does mandate at the very early stage of the process to provide information on compensation to landowners and other affected parties. And finally, as I mentioned before, the code only applies to public uh, to private land. So that means that non-private land is not regulated by the code of practice. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, the code of practice, we see this process as, as you get closer to the access stage, a transmission company will have to engage more directly with provide tailored communications to the directly affected party, but very early in the process, for example, we are requiring a transmission company to publish information online, then to provide general inform information to landowners, occupiers, but also other parties interested in land. We see this, for example, we understand that some companies are already providing fact sheets to the community more broadly. Um, we think that's a way that this obligation could be met. Um, so the code defines what we understand to be a landowner, what an occupier is, and what other parties interested in land. Um, I think it's important to clarify that other parties interested in land are other those parties that have a registered or recorded interest, and there's some exemptions to registered interest. For example, uh, it doesn't include mortgages that are not in possession of the land. So in practical terms, that means that a bank does not need to be contacted or notified or any other financial institution. 
um, and the purpose behind this process and um, before um, engaging early in the process with as many affected parties as possible is to facilitate engagement, to increase awareness. So at the moment when a company have, has to enter into a private agreement with a landowner and an occupier, everyone is aware of the new works that will be undertaken. Um, next slide, please. We, the first part of the code also regulates um, how communications and notices should be served. Um, we explain how they should be ser served to a natural person and to avoid a corporate. To a natural person, it should be in person, by post or electronically. Importantly, if electronic communications are chosen, a person must give consent to that type of communication. We have a set of rules there. Very happy to answer any questions you might have in relation to the communication notices requirement at the end of the presentation. Um, we also explicitly explain that, for example, reminders before accessing land, given the short notice, you can contact uh, landowners via an SMS or also via phone call if that's preferable. And next slide, please. And the final obligation on part one that I would like to um, to highlight with you is obligations on contractors. Um, the code clearly stipulates that when any third party or a contractor um, acts on behalf of a transmission company, uh, then the company is responsible for their behavior and is responsible for access on private land. So it's responsible for compliance with the code of practice by its contractors and also must make sure to implement appropriate processes and training in relation to compliance. So contractors also follow the rules that we're putting out and that will become uh, will come in effect on, for, on the 1st of March. Those are the key obligations that we put out on the first part of the code of practice. And now I'll pass it on to Reed, who will present part two of the code of practice. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jean-Paul, and hello, everyone. Um, so as Jean-Paul mentioned, I'll be taking you through part two of the code, which places obligations on transmission companies before accessing private land. Um, and the purpose of these obligations is to address concerns we've heard from landholders um, about relevant information and notice for land access not always being appropriately shared with the relevant parties, um, such relevant parties being landholders, um, occupiers and other parties interested in land. Um, so these obligations are also intended to assist a landholder decide whether they like to enter into an access agreement or not. Um, so overall, part two introduces obligations on a transmission company that relate to general communication and engagement obligations, information required to be provided to affected persons and interested parties, notice of access required to be provided prior to accessing land, and finally, exemptions to the notice of access. Um, and the following slides will go through these obligations in a bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please, Mava. So this slide relates to Division 5 of the code and covers communication and engagement activities. So Division 5 includes obligations to provide broad information about upcoming transmission company projects to landholders as soon as practicable and general obligations relating to consultation and engagement. Um, so on the screen is a basic summary of Clause 5.1 of the code, which obliges transmission companies to publish information on their websites early in the land access process. And such information includes details of the transmission project, the proposed timelines and milestones as soon as reasonably practicable in the land access planning phase, any updated project details as soon as reasonably practicable, a plain English summary of the transmission company's obligations under the code, including the option to enter into an access agreement and the rights of affected parties under Section 93 of the Electricity Industry Act, an explanation of what input from affected parties and other parties interested in land may be requested by transmission companies, the reasons why and at what stage of the project, and finally, any timely updates progress regarding the new transmission project or upgrade. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide provides an overview of clause 5.2 of the code, the obligation for transmission companies to consult with affected parties and, a, and any other parties interested in land. So before accessing private land or entering into an access agreement, a transmission company must identify who to consult with and keep a written record of the steps it has taken to identify the affected parties 
or other or any other parties interested in land inform, inform all affected parties and other parties interested in land of the proposed access to land and how to participate in the process and consult with affected parties and other parties interested in land being mindful of site specific by security needs, fire or health risks, and cultural heritage protections. So next slide, please. So this slide is an overview of clause 5.3, um, the obligation to provide an accessible point of contact. Um, and the focus of this obligation is for transmission companies to provide to landholders details of the point of contact, including their first name, um, and the, the full name of the contact person does not need to be provided, um, but they need to include their role, um, phone number and email address. Um, transmission companies must also respond without reasonable delay to any contact from an affected party or other parties interested in land during business hours. However, they may respond outside hours um, if reasonably necessary. And really the purpose of allowing a transmission company representative to only provide their first name uh, is in recognition of the potential safety concerns they, they sometimes face when interacting with landholders um, and therefore consider it sufficient for them to only provide their first name, their role, um, business number and email address. Next slide, please, Mabel. So clause 5.4 provides further information transmission companies must provide before accessing land. Um, and we heard during consultation that transmission companies um, have already been trained in stakeholder engagement. So we consider these obligations to be minimum expectations and should be reflective of current transmission company business practices. So prior to contacting a person, they must have relevant training in stakeholder engagement have relevant skills, trainings, and qualifications for the allocated task under the code, um, have relevant training in appropriate and effective stakeholder engagement, including training on engagement with traditional owners. And when a transmission company actually makes contact with any affected parties or other parties interested in land, they must identify themselves and the full purpose of the contact in any communications, including by telephone, email, or in person, and carry appropriate ID. Um, also just quickly worth clarifying here that a, a registered Aboriginal party do not need to be trained on engagement with traditional owners, but we expect transmission companies to engage with relevant bodies like the Federation of Traditional Owners Corporations, Victoria. Um, lastly, and in response to a question asked by Osnet prior to this session, um, requesting confirmation regarding um, the definition of stakeholder in using the code, um, so we use the term stakeholder uh, only once in clause 5.4.2 uh, when requiring training before contacting affected parties or other parties interested in land. Um, and this means that a transmission company needs to undertake stakeholder engagement training before contacting affected parties and other parties interested in land. Um, we, we chose not to define stakeholder um, as uh, that is the training we are requiring um, not the people transmission companies should be contacting. Um, ultimately, we are requiring transmission companies to train their staff in appropriate and effective engagement, and the obligation applies to affected parties and other parties interested in land. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're moving on to Division 6 now, um, where transmission companies must provide general information to affected parties on access rights and obligations. Um, so prior to giving a notice of access or entering into an access agreement, transmission companies must provide information regarding the rights of affected parties under Section 93 of the Act and this code of practice, the rights and obligations of the transmission company, including obligations for making full compensation for any damage sustained on the property whilst accessing land, mitigation and compensation protections that may apply under the Land Acquisition and Compensation Act, any payments made under and an access agreement. And finally, um, information on the rights of affected parties to refer a complaint to the Energy Ombudsman. Uh, next slide, please. So clause 6.2.1 places obligations on a transmission company to provide affected parties information regarding how the proposed land access interacts with environmental planning and other relevant statutory approval processes, the types of land access activities being undertaken on the land, 
the equipment and chemicals to be used, the number of people on the site and duration of land access activities, uh, land management obligations, including any biosecurity plans, um, the proposed dates for each instance of access over the access period, including a range of dates which must not exceed seven calendar days. Um, seeking feedback on proposed land access dates um, and transmission companies must also inform how affected parties can comment on any information sent and request changes to the pros, proposed dates or details of access. And finally, how to refer a complaint to EWOV. Um, so clause 6.2.2 .2 requires transmission companies to consider feedback or requests for changes from affected parties in good faith and must promptly provide an answer to the questions or response to feedback in writing, including the reasons for not accepting the feedback or requested changes. Next slide, please, Neva. So this slide is an overview of clauses 7.1 and 7.2 of the code, which covers the content of a notice of access and the maximum access period. So these obligations come into effect if an access agreement is not reached between a transmission company and affected party. A transmission company can use its powers under section 93 of the Electricity Industry Act to enter private land, provided it provides a notice of access. Um, and the maximum access period must not exceed six months. Um, if a transmission company wishes to access land after the expiry of the access period, it must provide a new notice. Uh, and the notice of access must also specify the right for an affected party to refer any complaints to EWOV. Next slide, please. So a notice of access must be sent at least 20 business days after providing info on access rights and obligations, and at least 10 business days before the start of the access period, specifying the access, the access period, the planned dates and times of access to land during the access period, and details of the access, including the information on the proposed access, um, I mentioned from a, a previous slide as per clauses um, 6.2.1 F to M. Um, a reminder, bonus, reminder notice must be sent by a transmission company to each affected party at least 48 hours before each proposed land access and to be delivered either in person or by telephone, email or text message. Now, next slide, please. So in the event of ch that changes to notified access are needed, um, a transmission company must not um, postpone or change the dates or times of access unless there are circumstances beyond their reasonable control. Um, if changes or postponement is necessary, transmission companies must use best endeavors to contact affected parties at least 48 hours before the original planned date and time of access. Um, an affected party may also request changes to plan access dates and propose alternative dates or times. And in this event, a transmission company must consider the request in good faith and advise the affected party whether it agrees to the request and provide reasons if it does not agree to the request in a prompt manner. If a transmission company agrees to the change request, then it must advise all affected parties that may be impacted by the amended date or time change. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so under clause 7.4, um, the code allows for exceptions to consultation and notice requirements. So firstly, the notice requirements um, I've just gone through do not apply when all affected parties have entered into an access agreement. Secondly, if an emergency requires um, a transmission company to gain immediate access to land without prior notice in order to meet any safety or other legal requirements or regulatory obligations, they must provide all affected parties with details of the access as soon as practicable. So this must include the date, time, duration, and purpose of the emergency access. Uh, so next slide, please. And I'll just hand over to Will to take us through part three of the code, um, which covers the obligations um, during land access um, under section 93. Thanks, Will. I think you're on mute, Will. Thanks, Reid. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Will, and I'll be walking you through the part of the presentation which talks about how transmission companies will have to act during land access. 
So I just like to reiterate that these obligations only apply to access under section 93 and any conditions for land access done under an access agreement are expected to be negotiated between the transmission companies and the affected parties and we won't be regulating that. So there's a clause in section 93 where it says transmission companies should do as little damage as be when exercising their land access powers. And this section of the code kind of goes into a, a little bit more detail about what sorts of things we expect transmission companies can do to minimize uh, impact on affected parties. In addition, um, there are also a set of minimum these are a set of minimum standards that we expect and companies can go above and beyond them. So this first slide provides a summary of the general and specific obligations for transmission companies when they access land. Uh, some of these general obligations are related to training, minimizing harm um, and damage to the land. Uh, most of these are based on standards that we set um, in the statement of expectations, which we released a lot earlier. Um, so there are also a number of spe specific obligations related to the management of fire health and biosecurity risks. And something else I'll also talk about a little later on are some details on the post access report and other reporting uh, requirements. So on to the next slide. Um, so just generally speaking, during access, the code will apply to all people accessing the land on behalf of the transmission company. Uh, this will include people who work for the transmission companies, such as land liaison officers, admin staff, etc. But it'll also include uh, contractors. So these could be people such as geologists, surveyors, uh, botanists, etc. Um, this first obligation requires transmission companies to make sure that all people accessing the land have the relevant skills, training and qualifications to undertake the allocated tasks. And they're also aware of their obligations under both the Electricity Industry Act and the Land Access Code of Practice. So this one's pretty straightforward. Um, contract contractors should have their relevant licenses and skills to do their jobs. Uh, and they should also have some sort of training to understand and follow the obligations outlined in both the LACOP and the Electricity Industry Act. And this second clause is sort of a general obligation that requires all people accessing the land to re respect the privacy, private assets and infrastructure of affected parties. Um, just moving on to the next slide. Um, we're going to go into some of the more specific obligations. Um, so these obligations are mainly based on the standards that we set out in the statement of expectations. Uh, the first one requires personnel who access the land to cause as little damage or harm to the land or anything living or growing on the land. So this, this will relate to crops, people and farm animals. For example, you know, they shouldn't try to trample crops or spook the farm animals, just general things like that. Um, the second one is to minimize time accessing the land um, and making sure that affected parties are inconvenienced for as little time as possible. So in general, land access will impact farming activities and keeping access short is the best way to sort of minimize this inconvenience for farmers. Um, the next one requires attendance to be minimized. So this sort of follows on from previous points about minimizing inconvenience uh, on the land. Uh, this next one is a little bit long winded, but it generally relates to the use of access tracks. It requires transmission companies to use existing roads to access the land and only work in specific designated areas. And if this isn't possible, they should try to consult with the affected parties to find the most appropriate entry points. Um, in the event that any damage occurs, they should also try to fix or remediate it afterwards. However, if they do make modifications, such as installing a new gate for an entrance, um, they can, by agreement with the affected parties, keep that access point there. Uh, so this next point uh, requires land accessees to leave all assets as they found them. Uh, this will include gates, fences, grids, and once again, this is unless the affected parties agree otherwise. Um, this next one um, 
basically says that transmission companies should also remove all transmission company assets off the property. This will include machinery, goods, equipment, and any rubbish once the access is completed. Finally, uh, once access is completed, um, transmission companies will need to inform all affected parties in writing about its completion. So uh, they'll also outline um, general activities that were performed during the access, and companies should take a log of activities undertaken during access. So I'll talk a little bit more about this reporting um, later. Uh, so these next, uh, this next slide, um, these specific obligations relate to fire, health, and biosecurity obligations. And in respect to these types of risks, the code obliges companies to implement policies and procedures which are in line with good industry practice. So this could include something like having a bushfire mitigation plan for fire risks and uh, also following standards from Agriculture Victoria for biosecurity risks. So I'd just like to highlight that the health obligations specifically uh, only apply to the health of people, whilst the health of animals will also, I mean, sorry, the health of animals will only be covered by the biosecurity provisions. Um, transmission companies are also obliged to inform affected parties of these specific policies and procedures and in the event of any incident, they should document it and directly communicate it to affected parties. Um, just moving on to the next slide. After land access concludes, um, companies will need to provide affected parties with a, what we like to call it a post access report. Um, so this report should be re provided within 15 business days once land access has concluded. Uh, this report will have important information, including the number of personnel in attendance of the land access, um, any locations accessed, any materials or chemicals used, um, any activities undertaken on the land, as well as how they might have followed any environmental health, biosecurity or fire procedures. Um, so directly after land access, if any if an environmental biosecurity uh, fire or health incident occurs, um, affected parties can request information from the transmission company uh, to help them sort of deal with that incident. This is to help them track and trace um, any potential source of these incidents. And transmission companies should provide this information as soon as it's reasonably possible. Um, for the next part of this presentation, I'll be passing on to Gareth who's going to take you through um, other obligations after access. Thank you, Will. Hello, everyone. Hope you're going well. My name is Gareth. I've been working on the project on Jean-Paul's team. I'll take you through this, um, this final part, uh, sort of mustard coloured slides. I've got five or six slides on this um, part four, and then we'll move into um, a question and answer time. Uh, just to raise your awareness too, there is a Q&A button I hope you might be able to see. Um, feel free to pop any questions in there or, or put your hand up at the end as we move on to that, that final part of the, um, the presentation for code. But before then, for these few slides, really going through the last fi final part, part four, and there are three aspects to this final part. One being dispute resolution and complaint handling um, as part of that record keeping, and reporting and for each of these I'll, I'll have a an additional slide with a little bit more info some of it will be self-explanatory some of it you may have some questions on but essentially that first part dispute resolution um, and complaints there's a obligation for a transmission company that's called by the code uh, to have an internal complaints handling process and this sort of external third party um, memberships scheme of a dispute resolution so that is stipulated by the code uh, as being run by EWOV the Energy and Water Ombudsman Victoria um, and there's some other obligations that I'll go through in a moment just around being clear with affected parties their rights essentially or what to expect through a complaint process how to escalate um, internally and then how to refer uh, and having a right to refer to EWOF with contact details, that sort of thing. Um, 
I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. And then the second part of this, the second section, our theme of this, this final part is record keeping. So that's about maintaining appropriate records. Um, could be contacts, um, communications with relevant sort of affected parties. Um, it could be photos, you know, videos, survey results, things that are taken during sort of Section 93 land access um, and anything sort of verbally, where it's verbal communication that is caught by the code in the sense that it sort of requires confirming in writing, you know, where that sort of verbal exchanges happen, perhaps between um, over the phone or perhaps it's face to face and and requ requiring uh, the recording of that, writing that, I mean, by recording. Um, and then those records of communications with that particular person may be made available uh, to that person if, if they were to request a sort of a record of the communications that you've had between um, yourselves and, and the relevant party. Finally, the, the last section, which I'll, I'll put a slide on in a second, is uh, just on reporting, kind of broken into two parts, really. Um, one is about reporting potential or actual breaches um, of the code to the Commission, uh, to ourselves, and there's a little bit more detail on that in a moment. And then the other part, which is if you are caught by the code or undertaking activities relevant uh, to the code of practice, there's a monthly reporting um, mechanism uh, and those reports are published on our website, but I'll, I'll touch on those in a moment. So I'm, I'll move on to the dispute resolution uh, complaint handling slide. That's OK. Thank you. But sort of two, two main obligations and they sit under sort of 11.1 um, of the code. And the first one is around the sort of dispute resolution scheme. I mentioned some of this, but that is with EWOV. And if you're caught, do, that's caught the wrong word. If you're undertaking activities uh, under the code of practice, then you must remain a scheme member uh, of EWOV um, until you've either sort of finished or not intending to undertake any more activities under the code of practice, which logical and then that there aren't any outstanding complaints with EWOV that relate to you know activities um, that were undertaken or not undertaken perhaps under the code so that those complaints have been resolved essentially um, so you must remain a scheme member until till those, that point. Um, the second part of the complaints dispute is, is around um, uh, this 11.1.2, I think it is in the code, and that is around uh, sort of obligations that relevant transmission company or transmission company called by the code um, must, must take a number of actions relating to sort of complaints, disputes, whether that's sort of proposed Section 93 access um, or actual Section 93 access. Um, that is around providing transparency about how to make a complaint, having a complaints process, which you implement, you know, in line with the Australian standard that's there and just being really clear about how to escalate through that. So that might be, you know, publishing that information on a website and providing it as part of an information pack or whatever that, that might look like. Um, and then just making sure that sort of any complaints um, or complainant is clear that they're able to refer a complaint to you of um and providing contact details around that as well fairly, fairly straightforward hopefully um i'll go to the next slide please talk about record keeping um there's a requirement in the code to retain sort of all relevant land access records for seven years relevant records being those things that sort of mentioned earlier so those records of all contact with affected parties um that could be recording you know, this specific using section 93 access that the notice of access that's issued as well under clause 7 or the, the different clauses under clause 7 um, keeping records of those verbal communications which I mentioned um, and making those communications between the relevant party available upon request so I'll move on to the final part which is really just performance reporting part. Um, these clauses 13.1 through to 13.4 are the relevant um, reporting requirements. So if you are undertaking activities under the code, relevant activities, um, 
then you must provide a monthly report to the Commission. And that just to be really clear, I think it's mentioned a couple of times, but operation maintenance activities for existing lines are not covered. Um, if there's any activities you're undertaking, there's, there's no report um, required. If you are, however, required to make a report, um, set up in the code is providing that report by the 10th business day of the following month. So if you were submitting the report on the 10th business day of July, it would contain the date of the preceding month of June. Um, if there's any confidential information you think you're providing as part of that, that monthly report, then you should flag that information, um, explain why it's confidential, and um, ensure that you um, are, are clear about that and provide a publicly accessible version uh, for publication. Worth noting, there is a um, performance reporting template on our website. There's a few small amendments or improvements being made to that currently, I believe, and that'll be published shortly. There's nothing just being changed from requirements from the code. That template should um, reflect what is in the requirements of the code, but it's just about making that clearer and easier. Um, I will move us to the final part. So what is in monthly reporting? So this is an, an exhaustive list and I, I won't read these also because it's a fairly um, detailed list but some of the key bits around what what is required to be within monthly reports um and why perhaps uh so it, it is things like us having an understanding of what is the what's the activity like on the ground um taking the temperature if you like seeing where are there um particular activity is is ramping up or, or ramping down um so there's a sense of or numbers for access agreement negotiations underway in, and entered into in that month. Um, numbers for how many notices were issued, how many times did they say land accessed under se section 93 versus under uh, an access agreement, um, the number of land parcels that were accessed, um, was the rescheduling mechanism that's under um, that the clause seven, which is issuing the notice for section 93, was was that used and why? And that's getting a sense of, you know, what's the certainty of, of dates and how often do they need to be rescheduled and is that working? Um, and then the final, what's I think sort of key bit of that reporting is around um, complaints, how many complaints, how long they take to resolve um, and what was the nature of that, those complaints that were received and that might give us a sense of are there trends over time you know are there particular areas where perhaps we need to look at and see is this bit working is this a particular area um that's that's particular friction um that's occurring with sort of the community so more detail on uh the dot specific dot points that in monthly report are under that 13.5 section, but just noting as well that the reporting template I mentioned will reflect the requirements that are required by that, um, that section of the code. And the final part of reporting, when we're talking reporting, talking breach reporting. So as I mentioned, any, any potential or actual breaches that occur um, under the code are required to be reported um, to the Commission. The place to, to look for which types of breaches are described as time one, more urgent, shorter timelines um, to be reported is in schedule two. So table one will say, well, as it's there on the slide, two days uh, within two business days of detecting reporting type one. Most of the clauses aren't type one. There's only a, a small handful, which I think relate to um, uh, working with the specific management plans and having those in place. So biosecurity management plans, fire risk management plans, and then type two breaches. This is down in table two and three. They're not on the slide, but just in that schedule at the end of the code, tables two and three will say what different types of breaches are uh, for the different clauses in the code. And then there's an annual report requirement, which is reporting on type two breaches and any other breaches um, that were uh, received uh, or reached in within that that year that that refers to. That is hopefully fairly self-explanatory, but we are moving into the question and answer session now. Um, so people may have questions 
that arise from any other part of the um, presentation as well. Um, but I'll, I'll open it up now and just open it up to the rest of the team as well. I'm not sure if we've got any questions in the Q&A as of yet. 